Good morning, everyone. Uh, so welcome to this first keynote session of the, today. Um, so my name is Matej Praputnik. I'm from National Institute of Chemistry, Ljubljana. Uh, I'm a member of Price Scientific Steering Committee, uh, and I'm replacing, actually, our chair, Natalie Reuter, who could not make it today, unfortunately. So I was also chair of Price Scientific Steering Committee two years ago. As was our uh, next speaker, Sylvie Josesom. Uh, Josesom. Uh, she was a chair of the Freight Scientific Steering Committee in 2015. So she is a climate expert in CNRS, uh, and uh, she, helps, uh, she, she holds many positions, or, or she held many positions in any, uh, many boards for climate modeling, uh, domestically as well as internationally. Perhaps I just mentioned that uh, she is a coordinator of uh, INES, of this infrastructure program uh, of European Network for, U uh, for Earth Science, uh, Earth System Modeling. And uh, as we all know that uh, climate uh, change is a pressing issue. Uh, and as in all other fields, uh, better infrastructure and experimental devices uh, provide better data, more data, which then allow us to uh, develop better models uh, with higher accuracy of prediction. Uh, so, uh, but this also then, of course, in turn, uh, uh, opens doors for the need of, for high, so for high, uh, high performance computing. And I'm very curious what is going on in climate, climate modeling. So please, Siri, uh, I'm very glad that you will present this lecture today. Oops. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for this kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give a talk on climate modeling with a focus on climate change. Uh, if I can get the slides, please, over there. And um, next, next one. <laughs> next one. Ah, c'est moi, excusez-moi. <laughs> sorry, that's it. No, sorry. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I knew it, but I forgot it. Okay, so I would like uh, to address uh, um, several points. First, uh, to introduce on uh, how climate change and climate modeling are related and uh, what is the contribution of climate modeling in this important issue, uh, this, this societal issue, issue of climate change. Second, on uh, give you a um, short panorama of introduction to climate models and the international landscape. Then on challenges in climate modeling, uh, tackling issues such as high, high performance computing and data, and then some conclusions. On, uh, on the first point, um, I cannot start without uh, showing you uh, where we are uh, as with a key indicator which is used for climate change, which is the global surface air temperature. You see a curve from 1850 until uh, 2021. This is the latest uh, one, where you can see that we have a clear trend, a clear increase, with the last decade being about one degree warmer compared to a reference. At its time, this is given to a reference, which is 1850-1900. That's where, why you see a zero line. This is the reference. And you see that we reach uh, one degree within 2020. We even reached 128.28 degree uh, with, uh, versus this re same reference. And each of the last four decades, so it's not just one year, it's not just the last year, it's each of the last four decades at each time has been warmer than the preceding decade, and this is the case since uh, 1850. So a clear uh, warming, a clear trend, sorry. It goes too fast. Parallel to this, we have a change in the atmospheric composition. This is shown here with um, the CO2, the green the, uh, carbon dioxide uh, uh, curves, where we, you see above zero the sources of CO2, where, which is uh, uh, linked with the, um, with the uh, fossil, fossil fuels, the use of fossil carbon. This is in gray, with uh, the, the, the 
coal, the oil, the gas, which are uh, a key use that we do about the fossil carbon, and we are reaching 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. And you have also uh, the land use change, which is also included in these uh, 40 uh, gigatons of CO2 per year, which is uh, typically deforestation, land use, which also consumes uh, carbon. Below zero, you have the sinks. So what is key for us is the atmosphere. This is the light blue where we reached 410 parts per million uh, in 2019 compared to uh, the pre-industrial time. This is an increase of 48%. We were at 277 parts per million. And this is quite unprecedented in the last uh, 800,000 800, years as seen from the deep ice cores. But you see that there is also part of the CO2 that goes in the ocean and in the land. And we are fortunate, only half of the CO2 that we emit stays in the atmosphere. The system itself is able to clean or to absorb half of the CO2 we, we emit. So uh, whether the two are related for that, we need the models. So those climate models, which uh, we often also call Earth system models, are modeling the Earth's climate system. This is the climate part of the Earth system. Are there uh, to understand and predict climate viability and change. They encompass the representation of the atmosphere with the winds, with the pressure, with the water cycle, which is quite key in the system. The oceans, where we also represent the uh, energy changes, the temperature, salinity, transport in the ocean. The continents, which interact with the atmosphere, with our, uh, the soil, which is a, a water reservoir and heat reservoir, and also the representation of uh, the surface with the topography, with the vegetation and uh, the rugosity of, um, of the surface as well. And uh, uh, you also have uh, uh, the natural and anthropogenic forcing. So the natural are typically the solar, the volcanoes, but the anthropogenic are what we emit in terms of greenhouse gases, but also of fine particles which are called aerosols. And all that are represented in, uh, in the system. So uh, with these models, we can uh, simulate the... the uh, how the temperature of the Earth has uh, increased or has varied uh, since uh, 1850. And you, saw, you see in uh, black, uh, this is the observation curve that I already just uh, showed you. And you have two sets of simulations that are not just, not just done with one model. They're, 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 this is done by, with several models, or 20 to 30 models, with our, uh, at each time several experiments to do in for viability. And you have a set of simulations in blue, including only the natural forcings, solar, volcanoes, and the internal viability of the system, which is part of the system. And uh, you see that in the light blue, we are absolutely unable to uh, explain the trend and the warming. If then uh, you go in a set of simulations in, in beige, including the human and natural uh, forcing, you see that the models reproduce the main uh, trend uh, quite in a good way. Not exactly, we have, the system is chaotic, we cannot reproduce exactly what happens each year, but we can reproduce the, the main trend and even reproduce some of the uh, a bit lower values which are uh, most often associated with uh, volcanoes. So this has led to the fact that uh, uh, um, there is an equivocal influence, human influence, in this uh, warming. And this is seen in the atmosphere, but not only in the atmosphere, this is seen also in, ocean, in land, in ocean, in the sea ice. So there is an increasing uh, uh, evidence uh, that uh, indeed this warming is due to greenhouse gases, and the models are key to uh, interpret the observations. Then the models are the only tools that we have for the future. 
What can we say about the future? Then using these uh, models, we can force them with different scenarios of greenhouse uh, gas emissions, of aerosols, of land use uh, change, and uh, produce those curves that have been uh, presented in the last IPCC uh, uh, Sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was issued uh, last uh, summer. That's uh, AR6, the sixth assessment report of this uh, IPCC exercise. And uh, you have a curve showing not only the historical part that I just showed you, but then different, the, the answer of the models uh, for different scenarios, whether uh, in red, a high to very high uh, emission level, where, uh, for example, the highest, you will reach a doubling of these 40 uh, gigatons of CO2 per, per year in the mid-century, 2050 and uh, uh, reach at the end of the century by a temperature that uh, we are no more at one degree, but reaching four, uh, uh, even a bit higher than four degrees Celsius. Then an intermediate uh, scenario, which is in yellow, and low emission scenarios that uh, are there to mimic what can, could be done with the policy, uh, reducing emissions, typically, uh, the lowest scenario is a case where we reach zero CO2 emission by mid-century. So rather than 80 gigatons of CO2, we reach zero CO2 uh, emissions. And at the end of the century, we keep in the limit of 1.5 degree, which is the one that is recommended that was decided at the Paris Agreement. So to reach no more than two degree global warming, and if possible, really limit to 1.5 degree. Uh, associated to that, so the models don't, don't only give you, of course, this global trend, global curves, but also the geographical patterns of the warming, with the warming which is higher over land than over ocean, higher in the high latitudes than in the mid latitudes, and uh, of course, uh, higher is the scenario, Warm, warmer is the planet. Here you have the planet with four degree warming and below a planet with 1.5. And it's not just the warming, it's also the precipitation that are associated. If you have uh, with a warmer uh, planet, you have more precipitation and not just a little bit more of precipitation, but it's also more heavier precipitation. So heavy events of um, events of heavy precipitations. For the temperature, the same. It's also more extreme events of warmth, like heat waves. It's also uh, a risk of floods, a risk of uh, uh, drought. So it's increasing the risk. And the higher the temperature is, the higher the risk are. And the, the models more and more encompass also the carbon cycle, so they are able to reproduce this uh, uh, cycle. And here, what they show is that uh, the temperature uh, change is highly correlated to the cumulative CO2 emissions. So the more we accumulate emissions in uh, the system, we reach now about uh, nearly uh, 2,400 2, gigatons of CO2, CO2 cumulated since uh, the start of pre-industrialization. And uh, you see that uh, uh, if we, uh, uh, a low scenario means that we have to limit the amount of cumulative carbon. And this is in blue, you see that we have up to now uh, these values since uh, over the last 20 years and uh, only uh, a, a, a smaller amount by 2050 if we want to stay in that. So less than what we have emitted in the last uh, 20 years. And if we uh, emit more, we will reach the higher temperature. So it also gives a key indication of how much carbon we still can emit if uh, we want to stay at a certain level of uh, temperature increase. And, uh, uh, there again, the climate models are key as a key tool to simulate this carbon cycle and uh, inform on uh, decision for a mitigation policy. On the climate models and the international landscape, um, so the, those models, they represent the, the system, the atmosphere, the different components, so the atmosphere, the ocean, the land surface, there are, there are coupled models 
as they also represent the sea ice. So there, though, this is the physical system with the temperature, the water cycle, the energy exchanges, the circulation. And in fact, the, the first of those uh, global models has been developed by Dr. Suki Manabi, uh, who uh, got the Nobel Prize for this uh, uh, in uh, physics uh, last uh, in 2021. 20, uh, and he did a tremendous work, and it was really a great advance uh, thanks to his uh, work on those uh, global models. He's really the father of those uh, models used to infer science and knowledge on their particular for CO2 impact on, uh, on the climate. So it's not only the physical components that we are included, including we are including also the biogeochemical cycles, so with the atmospheric chemistry, like trace gases, like uh, CH4, uh, ozone, that are trace gases, and aerosols, so the small particles. On land, the vegetation, so the biosphere, the biology of the system, so the vegetation and its dynamics in the land, the biogeochemistry chemistry in the ocean, since the biology plays a key role in the CO2 cycle in the ocean, absorbing CO2, releasing uh, CO2, uh, storing CO2, so it's quite an important role of the biology in the system. So that's what we call an earth system model, so encompassing not only the physical part of the system, but also all the biogeochemical cycles. These models are based on physical laws, so the uh, Navier-Stokes for the circulation, conservation laws, um, conservation of mass, of water, of uh, energy, and uh, parametrization, but also parametrization. So there are processes for which we do not have physical laws. We have to keep the fact that when we pro uh, simulate clouds, they have to conserve water, they have to take the, uh, the thermodynamic laws, but we don't have um, really a direct model of clouds, so we need to have parametrization for clouds for surface fluxes, so energy turbulent fluxes at the surface, for radiation, for subscale processes. And all that, uh, uh, if we uh, take the overall of those models, they have been developed over the last 30, 40 years, uh, gradually uh, improving and taking more into account the complexity. And I estimate about 1,000 man years, the time to really um, of man uh, uh, resources develop uh, encompassed in those uh, models. So they have a strong legacy, which is one of the difficulty uh, when you have to uh, adapt those models uh, uh, to different architectures. The way we work and all the uh, assessment report of IPCC is based on that is thanks to the World Climate Research Programme through what we call couple uh, intercomparison project and we have the six phase uh, that has been uh, used for the uh, six assessment report. So typically uh, agreeing, the community agrees on a set of experiments, of common experiment. Last time we had 23 endorsed modern intercomparison project. They are highlighted uh, here on this uh, diagram, showing that the main uh, uh, questions were to uh, have experiments to help answer what is the response of the system to forcing, what are the better document the systematic biases of the models, and uh, uh, better understand and predict the viability and uh, uh, the the answer of the system to future scenarios. So those set of experiments are key, uh, not only to project what can happen in the future, this is the uh, upper part of the iceberg, this is the one which is the more mediated, but its value, its key value, uh, is also uh, uh, relies on uh, really a set of experiments to evaluate the capacity of the models with different timescales, even using the past, the deep past, like the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, and also a set of experiments to understand, better understand the system. And uh, if you look per model, typically um, these represent about 20 to 50,000 simulated years. And in terms of computing an effort per model, of more than 100 million hours, several models have used 300. Uh, million core hours 
to do to run those experiments that uh, are there uh, to serve as a, a reference. And they produce a, num a large number of data per model once again, at uh, one to 10 petabytes. They don't share all the data at the international, but they share quite an important part. And this has served as input to the last SPCC report. This is not all climate science. This is a part of what we do. The, above that, you have all the other experiments that are not done in a coordinated way, just to understand uh, different uh, mechanisms. But this is an important reference set of uh, uh, experiments. Uh, typically, this requires quite uh, a strong infrastructure. We have a, a, data inf a common data infrastructure to exchange the data. This is something that the Easiness project, which is the infrastructure for the European Network for System Modeling, is supporting in Europe, and I'm coordinating this infrastructure project. And you see here, the, on the figure, you see the different data nodes. So the different models host uh, data nodes, and uh, uh, the, they are seen just as one uh, system using grid approaches, with some nodes serving also as index node, and more and more also trying to develop some possibilities to have some compute facilities uh, near, the, near the data. In overall, this Earth System Grid Federation, this is 30 petabytes of data that are shared like this, with the last uh, CEMIP uh, ex exercise being uh, reaching 22, nearly 23 petabytes of data. You see that I have put in parentheses without replica 12 petabytes because we have a redundancy uh, system with a replica system to be sure that if uh, one uh, node is down, we have uh, access to the information. It's difficult to know exactly how many users we have since this is a, a system uh, now. It has been, we had a, a system of uh, a login of, um, uh, for some time. Now it is quite completely open. The data, when they are put there, are open straight away. So it's completely open to the international community because it serves climate science. It serves also all the community that works on what we call climate impacts, so working on the impacts of climate change. And it, it is also uh, used uh, by uh, services like climate services, so completely open even for commercial. And uh, those data are fair, so completely open co with the common data and metadata standards. And this is a multi-agency support. DOE in the US plays a key role, NASA as well. And in uh, Europe, that's easiness. So the fact that we have a common European infrastructure is, is a, plays a key role to be one of the players. About half of the developments are done in Europe, half in uh, the US. We also have Australia. And uh, these data are then brokered in the Copernicus system, which, is, uh, which are services to uh, help uh, addressing more the policy or a larger range of uh, users. And so that's the ENS community that provides access to the climate uh, projections in the climate change service of Copernicus. To give you uh, an idea of uh, how many data are exchanged, uh, this is from uh, only the European nodes. And you see the statistics from the uh, second stage of easiness and now the third uh, stage. And you see that with the last exercise, we reach value in the 400 to 500 terabyte exchange per month. And we have a number, uh, an average number of distinct users per month of 7,000, uh, but it reaches in some time uh, uh, 10, uh, even more than uh, 10,000 uh, users per month. So quite active uh, uh, exchange of data. On the challenges, so looking more uh, ahead of us, we, uh, the World Climate Research Programme has recently issued uh, um, a new strategy, a strategic plan, showing four main uh, objectives with the fundamental understanding of the climate system. So we still need, we still have a need for fundamental understanding, not only understanding uh, what ha can happen with climate change, to understand viability and how the system, the feedbacks work in the couple system. Second, the prediction of what we call the near term. The near term is seasonal to decadal time scale where we can do some predictions, so initialized simulations where we can have some information about the possibility of the, the path in the coming years. It's not 
exact path. We are in a chaotic system, so it's a probabilistic uh, approach. But this is quite key for adaptation. And a long-term response to the climate system, and typically uh, this is uh, uh, quite important for uncertainties, for feedbacks, and for what we call mitigation policy, but also adaptation. An issue uh, also that for those long-term are the issue of possible tipping points, so points where we could reach uh, an extreme or something that really uh, is a big change, an abrupt uh, change of the system. And the fourth one, bridging uh, climate science and society, typically what I mentioned with the climate services, so this information is more and more used for decision making. So we have to go from understanding to informing society using both modeling and observation. So it's not only based on modeling, but modeling has a role to, to play. To, uh, uh, this system is clearly a multi-scale system, uh, a multi-scale uh, in space from uh, meter, kilometer, 100 to 1,000 uh, and more, but also in time from uh, minutes, second minutes, hours to a uh, millennia. And so up to now where we are, the climate models, they have usually a special resolution of about 100 to 200 kilometer, let's say 100 kilometer now. The last exercise, so CMIP6, we went down, uh, oh, plus, sorry. We went down uh, 25 uh, kilometer at best. And there, are, uh, um, there is some ongoing work to try to reach the kilometer scale where you have uh, a gap and a possibility to represent explicitly some part of the system, not all. You see that we still have a lot of special uh, uh, scales uh, below and a very short time uh, that need to be included. So uh, associated to that, high performance computing, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, of course, a, a lot of uh, need behind uh, this, and uh, what is done is often a compromise between uh, the different directions. The different directions are typically resolution, so the special resolution. We have uh, to, uh, when we double the special resolution, so uh, decrease by a factor of two, the lati latitude, longitude directions, we have a factor for the computing of eight. If we also decrease well, increase the resolution in the vertical, that would be uh, 16, because we have the time step to reduce. Complexity, uh, we introduce more and more carbon cycle, aerosol, chemistry, the biosphere, that's about a factor of five to 10. The duration, this is something which is quite key in the climate system. It's not only to do, um, compared to weather, we need really to do relatively long simulations. And uh, uh, typically, uh, to be able to do multi-decadal, so those mitigation scenarios, to multi-centennial, if we want to see the risk of abrupt events, for example, we need at least five what we call simulated years per day. This is a key measure in our case, how many years of the model we can simulate in one day of computing. So uh, in this case, it's at least you need uh, something like five uh, simulated years per day. And ensemble size, document the internal viability, quantify uncertainty, that's a factor of 10 to 30. Uh, now, in the last exercise, uh, typically we reach about 30 experiments. There has been some very large ensembles. What we call very large ensembles are south 100, 100 experiments. That's the biggest we ha uh, that has been done up to now. So for the special resolution, uh, here an example with a 25 kilometer, which is, um, um, has been used in, uh, as called in what we call high-res BIP, uh, high-resolution model intercomparison project. You see, for example, here for the, the track density of cyclones, so where you have the pass of the, the number of paths of the cyclones, you have here the uh, observations in the North Atlantic that show you where you have the pass the main paths of the cyclones. And you see the models at different resolution that has been done with the UK uh, Hadley model. And you see that 100 kilometer, you are unable to reproduce that. Better at 60, but much better at 25. Still not perfect, but much better in, uh, at this resolution. Uh, we also need for the impacts to be able to reproduce uh, river and uh, uh, precipitation viability of the system. 
And here is the bias in precipitation variability in the Danubius uh, region. And you see with a range of models with a CMIP5, which was the previous generation, where the highest resolution was more in the 100 kilometers. And you see the error bars, the, the bias of the models. From those global models, often what we do is we do a regional focus with regional models, and you see what was done with those regional models, and the CMIP6 with higher resolution, still a bias, still not perfect, but a bit better for the regional. So there is a hope to go with higher resolution to better uh, um, simulate what happens at a local scale, which is important for precipitation, typically. One um, uh, trend, one type of activity which is ongoing is to go even higher towards the kilometer scale, which is quite demanding on computing. And this is a target which is both for weather and climate. And you have here an intercomparison uh, uh, which has been done, which is called Diamond, led by the Max Planck in uh, Hamburg, where you have uh, uh, simulations with uh, observations in the middle and a set of models in the 3 to uh, 10 uh, kilometer uh, range uh, compared. Uh, here uh, you see that you are a, the, those models are able to simulate the main convective uh, uh, regions. You have to take care that this is more a weather mode. This is not a climate simulation. This is a weather simulation on the 4th of August, initialized on the 1st of August, so really short term since the initialization. And those intercomparison, we are talking about 40-day experiments, so we are no more talking about 100, 200-year simulations like CMIP6, but we talk about 40 days simulations. But that's the start. And there is a hope that uh, this can be, uh, those models can uh, uh, help better address the regional scale and uh, uh, improve the representation of clouds. Um, this is going to be used more and more for weather. For climate, this is just starting. There is really a need uh, to increase the speed uh, of uh, the models. Typically, when this exercise was done, the ICON model, the German model, the, the performance was only six simulated days per day, so we were not talking about years, but days, on the, uh, 13 southern cores. Now they managed to reach about 0 0.6 simulated years per day, which is much better, using the Dual Booster uh, NVIDIA uh, nodes, but we are still, they are uh, still at simulating only a few, uh, a few years, so we are still some steps before we can really use it for, for climate. Let me alors, uh, make sure I'm not sure how the film starts. Whoops, oh, yes, it starts. So the, the observations and uh, a set of simulations with the French models, the IPSL and the Meteo France models with our 30 ensembles or, or 10 simulations for the other one. And interestingly, you see that one of those, in each case, looks a bit more like the observed. But we can never reproduce exactly what happens in the observations. And this internal variability is an intrinsic part of the uncertainty, and we cannot cope with it. It's not the higher resolution which is going to solve it. We have internal variability in the system, and we can only tackle it by doing a set of simulations and not just one. And this is something that uh, needs to be addressed even with very high resolution. On, uh, if I want to summarize the different uh, sources of uncertainties, I showed you initially uh, the scenarios with a range of responses, and indeed emission scenarios are a key uncertainty. You have internal viability that I just illustrated, I, sorry, and you have model uncertainty. Model uncertainty is what is due to structural uncertainties like the resolution, the, the physics, uh, the way uh, the different physical processes are represented. But there are also parametric uncertainties. So even when you have a parametrization, you can have a range of uncertainty on the choice of parameter. So we have model uncertainties. Let me illustrate that on the figures here. Here is schematized uh, the range of uh, scenarios for, for the future. 
And you see in uh, a green the uncertainty associated with the scenario. This is the biggest, but this is the positive one. This is the one on which, with policy, we can act on, uh, on the system. But you also have the internal viability in orange and the model uncertainty in blue. And you can see that when you are near the initial state here, uh, scenarios are not important at all. What is important is internal viability and the models, but internal viability plays quite a key role. And when you go further in time, the uncertainty becomes to be more related to the scenario, of course, but also to the models, even if internal viability has to be accounted for. If you look at the uncertainty in the model, here you, we have, you have what we call uh, climate sensitivity, which is the set of answer when you double CO2. And uh, you see um, uh, uh, CMIPS 3 that was used in uh, IPCC AR um, 4 in 2007, CMIPS 5 that was 2013, now 2021, and you see that all the models, and we reach about uh, 60, uh, we have about 30 modeling groups, 30 models uh, worldwide, uh, we have a range of the answers, and this is quite a large uncertainty, which is why we, we, we need to have this multimodal approach. On uh, another aspect that we need not to forget is that we may miss some of the feedbacks. Here you have the assessment for the sea level rise, which gives you uh, a set of answers for the end of the century between 50 and about, about one meter uh, sea level rise. And you see another curve here, which is something which has low likelihood but which may happen indeed if there, is, if there are big instabilities of the, of the uh, Antarctic ice sheets. And this is not yet taken into account in the models, nor is taken into account the possible uh, big feedbacks that may occur with uh, uh, permafrost uh, thawing and the release of methane in the atmosphere. So do not forget that we have also some interesting uh, uh, missing feedbacks that uh, may also uh, interfere in the system. We have to prepare for future architectures. Their models uh, have started. They have redesigning often their uh, dynamic, what we call the dynamical cores. We, were, we used to have models that have a singularity at the pole, but this is very bad for uh, the, uh, the, the time steps because you have this convergence of their Meridians. So uh, you have typically uh, here a dynamical core based on icosahedric. This is the case for the French model, but also the German model. Some others use cube sphere, and uh, uh, some groups are also uh, preparing. Uh, the groups are starting to prepare for uh, GPUs. Very few, no, no, no um, simulation shown in CMIP6 has been run with using GPU. We are all based on CPU. Some models start to be able to use their GPU, but very few of those. There are uh, some of the groups have decided to completely redesign the models using a separation of concern approach, so separating the algorithm from uh, the, uh, the, the kernels, the, the more um, uh, approach uh, uh, associated with a computer, so uh, using, for example, nuclear uh, cyclone in Switzerland, the Dawn, and the Easy Way Center of Excellence uh, uh, compares the two approaches, see how they can complement each other. But uh, uh, it is quite a challenge in our community to be able to use efficiently those. Uh, uh, those machines, uh, due to the fact that we have a, a model, is, a climate model is not just one code, it's seven codes, it's the, uh, that are coupled all to, together, strong legacy, uh, and we have uh, uh, quite some work, and not even some, for example, for the ocean, it's not even yet sure that we can really use efficiently the, the GPUs. We are going to have, Easiness is organizing with Easy Ways uh, a, a workshop uh, in May where we want to make uh, the status on that since uh, to have a better view of where the community are. And uh, the data, where am I with the time, I'm afraid? Yeah, okay. The, the data is also quite an important issue. We produce quite a large number of data. Interestingly, you have uh, the, the overpack in, um, 
2011, showed, uh, did this diagram where he said where in 2015, 2016, we will reach about 50 petabytes in the community within blue, the data from satellites, in yellow, the data from models. So expecting that models are going to reach as much and maybe even more than uh, the satellite data. And uh, I take the diagram from the NASA in 2017, where at NASA, in uh, 2017, you see that they reach indeed largely uh, reach the 50 petabyte, and the model part is even bigger than the satellite part. And uh, the, if we look through, t through time, in fact, we are going to reach the exaflop even before the exabyte. So data is quite a key issue, and we, there, are, there is ongoing work to deal with parallel I.O. We are using parallel I.O. servers to uh, also prepare to do some on-the-fly processing to avoid storing too many data, to use compression, to use a reduction of data. So even if we have a big resolution, a high resolution, you can reduce the data that you store and uh, uh, develop computing near the, the data. To conclude, uh, so the, the climate models are at the core of the climate information for mitigation and adaptation, but also there is a need for understanding. We have not yet solved all the understanding, and we tend to forget. We are so much absorbed by this climate change issue that we tend to forget that we are also a climate science, and we have understanding issues, not just the issue of climate change, but we have to produce information to society. So it's a community which has a lot of tension between all those two uh, aspects. We are going to work with a range of simulations. We cannot say that uh, all is going to be done only with very high resolution. We need a range. We will necessarily address the, all the questions by a range of simulations from low to high or to very high resolution. And both are needed and complementary. So we have a number of challenges to be able to prepare for future architectures. We have those legacy codes, ensemble of codes, complex workflows at each time. We're a bit, we are not the ones that can easily jump from one machine to another. And uh, really to be able to invest a new machine, we need to be sure that we are going to be able to use it for several years because it's a very large investment at each time. And data we have, to manage a large amount of data and also we work on easing access to the, the wide range of those data to a large community. Thank you. Sorry if I've been a bit long. Thank you very much, Savi, for this very nice overview over the state of the art climate modeling. I'm sure there are questions. Let me just start. Uh, you mentioned that there are certain processes that you don't have models for, that you need this parameterization. So, what is the reason? Is this because you don't have enough resolution or data? The, um, it's the, the scale of the processes which is uh, key for, for the clouds. We can see directly ourselves that the clouds that does not develop at this uh, very large uh, scale, so you need to be able to represent the effect of those clouds. Uh, even even at, at one kilometer, you begin to be able to represent some parts of it explicitly by the equations, but even the microphysics is not going to be there. The microphysics occurs as even smaller scale. The turbulence occurs as small scale. So, we, people for, for to develop uh, parametrization, they work, for example, with large ED simulations to, uh, uh, to improve the way we represent. We use, of course, observations with observational campaigns and systematic uh, satellite data. So that's quite an activity to be able to represent as best as possible those processes which you cannot resolve explicitly due to the range of uh, space and time scales. So you mean here in data-driven manner? Sorry? In data-driven manner. So you, yeah, uh, it's, um, there is a trend, uh, uh, when you mentioned data-driven, uh, there is a, um, 
um, relate, relatively to artificial intelligence, uh, uh, first uh, people are, uh, we are using the art methods uh, like neural networks have been used quite a long time, uh, since a long time for the analysis of the model results. But now there is also uh, a try to develop some parametrization using AI approach. That, so that's a new, a new uh, stream, still uh, just uh, in the development phase. But uh, uh, try to make uh, use a range of uh, uh, different hierarchy of models to, 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 do the, to develop the parametrizations, but also try to use uh, AI. But the problem is there uh, the amount of observations to be able to use AI. So there are ideas like we could use the very high resolution to, so models to, to drive parametrizations for the lower resolution. So that's something that probably will be uh, more and more developed in the future. So using this range, also using the models. Mm -hmm. But here you are referring also for uh, forecasting, so for learning effective dynamics with AI, for, it, for example, recurrent neural networks. Uh, for, I'm um, not sure to understand exactly your question. Yeah, well, yeah. So basically you can do this multi-scale approach or you just, predict the dynamics. The yeah, the, um, there is, um, uh, there has been some uh, uh, experiments done with uh, using AI for weather forecast. Mm -hmm. For climate, uh, what is a bit complex is to be able to train uh, the, uh, and emulate. You have some emulators, but they have, they, they use all the bases like the CMIP uh, simulation, so they cannot, uh, but and they are there to emulate for the different uh, past scenarios. But uh, if you really want uh, to have a full climate model with an emulator, uh, it, there are some people that are trying to do so, some parts of it, but it's uh, uh, quite beyond what can be done. And even if you train uh, uh, a model, the problem is that the future is a different climate. It's not the same as today. So for a weather forecast, you have more chance to be in something that has already a hack occurred, and you have a lot of data to train uh, your model for the climate. Uh, we have no analog of, the, of what is going to happen in the future, and I cannot say even for the past. I mean, uh, we cannot uh, train, uh, if you train today, you have no chance to be able to reproduce the deep past or the future. So that's a tricky point for, so no, it's not seen as the solution for us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, here. Sylvie, <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. I have one question. Um, you already said that you, in the, in the um, IPCC results, you have like 10 petabytes of data that you share in a fair way, meaning you provide that for 10 years, people can reproduce and you know, analyze the data. But you also showed that in the near future, you will have exabytes of data. Mm. Um, so the question is twofold. What is your plan or what's the approach to share and analyze that data with um, the community? And the second part of my question is, um, do you expect, what, what do you expect to be the most difficult part of, of the, the simulation? Basically dealing with the data or getting sufficient flops to do the simulation? Um, both. <laughs> I'm afraid that we have to address both uh, the data issue and the simulation issue for the uh, for the sharing, it's, uh, what is shared is, let's say, roughly about a tenth of what is produced, so it's only a part of what is produced. This, the, the models keep much more information than what is uh, shared with the others. And uh, yes, the, probably the more uh, on-the-fly processing is something which is going to develop, especially if we want to run large ensembles, it's not going to be able to reprocess all the data after the simulation. So we have really to prepare to be able to uh, do uh, more on the fly compression. Uh, so really all what I mentioned are uh, uh, shown in, uh, done in parallel. In one of the curve I showed, you see CMIP5 and CMIP6, so easiness two, easiness three, and you see that we, yes, we have strongly increased. We were, uh, uh, we have a factor of 10 between the two exercises, at least uh, in the amount of data uh, shared. So, uh, 
they are um, whether in the future we will use a bit more cloud approach we those are under discussion and uh, for the next exercise which is not yet decided but yeah we have a number of issues to address and not only computing Thank computing you. and data there is one over there yes can you hear me Great. Um, I have a technical question. So you mentioned some figures on the Jewel booster nodes. Where, where, where is the person? Yeah. Sorry. I can oh, it's terrible. You, you can't <laughs> see from here. Yeah. So um, you talked about the performance you could get on the Jewel's booster nodes, uh, which look very promising when we compare it to the CPU architecture that you mentioned just before. Um, it seems that it's not uh, yet at the five simulated years per day that you are targeting. And my question is, do you think that the HPC systems to be delivered, such as Lumi or the Leonardo system at Chineca, uh, will enable you to reach uh, this target? Or is it just only one step before we can reach uh, your targeted performance? Now, for, the, for the very high resolution, they target more one simulated year per day than five. The five is more for the long term, so it's more for the multi-decadal. If you stay on the few decades, you can manage with one simulated year per day. The Icon group, yes, they, they have the hope to reach this one simulated year per day with systems like uh, in the class of, the, of Lumi. And, um, and the Chineca machine, so Leonardo. And uh, so, th yes, there is a hope to, to be able to reach the one simulated year per day, but they, this will uh, do simulations that are more in the few, few decades, and not necessarily a large number of simulations, and very few models, let's say. So it's, part, it's pushing the frontier in one direction. It does not address all the directions that we have to address. Okay, thank you. You have, my question here, um, you have stressed the importance of having oops, sev oops, oops. several models at once. Oui. And now the question is, when it comes to policy, is there, does there exist any scenario which does not involve a massive um, change, so adaption of society? Not sure to capture your question. You have you have different models of the climate change. Yeah, of the climate change. Which of climate, lead yeah. to different adaptation and mitigation scenarios. Yeah. Is there any one of those models which does not imply or suggest a massive scale of adaption in the society to cope with it? Uh, no, no, no. You don't have one of the models that shows that we have not to care with climate change, I'm afraid. We cannot, uh, all the models agree, even if they have a range of answers. What happens is it is quite linked with the clouds. Some uh, say that the clouds, uh, we, you, you have in the system positive uh, feedbacks. If you increase the CO2, you have a direct effect, direct warming. Then you have water vapor that is more important in the atmosphere, just due to physical laws. So second, uh, further uh, positive feedback. So because water vapor is one of the key uh, uh, greenhouse gas in the system, natural uh, part of the system. And then uh, you have some of the models that show with the clouds they could slightly lower the positive feedbacks or further increase the positive feedbacks, but none of them show that there is no issue with climate change. Uh, they all agree on, uh, they, they have a different amplitude and it's very difficult to say which one is, uh, is better than the other because they can be better on one aspect and less good in another aspect. So, unfortunately, we need a range of those models and uh, they all agree. But no um, hyper light speed computer will save us from having to change massively our lifestyle in order no. to save the planet, right? No. No, Thanks. no. What we expect is that the, the computers will help us uh, better uh, um, uh, inform society for adaptation, for example, or, uh, better understand the, the feedbacks uh, with the carbon, how do we get to this neutrality, and uh, what is the role of the sinks, because I've showed you uh, ocean and carbon sinks in the ocean and the land, unfortunately, with the warming. The, the things are, are slightly decreasing, so we need to really uh, uh, capture that well as well. So 
But uh, no, it's not going to save us. Uh, it's even, uh, even um, in the community, we have also uh, other issues like uh, how do we, we are pushing for reduction of CO2, but we are also users of those computers that produce CO2. So there is also a trend in the community to say uh, how, much, how far do we go? How many simulations do we do? Or should we try to reduce uh, our carbon footprint associated with uh, high performance computing? So it's a, uh, but it's not going to solve the, the issue. But it's important for informing the society. If we are better prepare, prepared, we will better cope with the risk of extremes. So that's a key challenge in the, for adaptation. Well, on this um, note, I would like to thank yeah, Siri once again for this very interesting talk. Thank you.